Hello, everyone. Um, I think it's I think it's going. All right, we're good. Uh, my name is Adam Hudlow. Um, I am the professor of music theory at Northwestern State University up here in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Um, and uh, I'm here today to talk to you about how to prepare your aspiring music majors to pass their music theory placement exam when they get to college. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of material um, today, so hopefully we can get through this uh, without a whole lot of issues with technology. Um, let me say uh, right up front that I want you to um, ask questions because um, in, in the chat, because if you have anything that you need me to clarify um, or maybe something that you uh, don't quite understand, just let me know in the chat and we'll try to get to those answers as best as I can uh, throughout this. Okay. So um, the first thing is, uh, if any of you, uh, you know, have music degrees like most of us do, uh, when you got to college, you had to take a, a test, most likely, in uh, how to uh, do basic music theory stuff in order to get placed uh, into your first music theory class. Um, but uh, maybe as a student, you didn't think about why we give that test. So why are theory placement exams even a thing? Well, obviously, they let us as the professors know uh, what a student uh, is able to do, obviously, when they get to college, how ready they are to jump into a pretty rigorous music um, course of study. But uh, unlike other degrees, like if you go to college to be, I don't know, a veterinary tech major, they don't expect that you know a whole lot of stuff about you know, biology or veterinary technology, especially. Um, but we kind of assume our music majors have been performing uh, for the better part of a decade when they get to college. And uh, so that means that students need to do a little bit of exceptional preparation to be ready to go into college uh, and to be successful. Um, the only exception uh, to these tests is that most of the time, uh, oral skills, whether it be singing or listening skills, uh, usually is not covered on an exam like this. Um, but we'll talk about that a bit in a, in a minute. Um, these exams also best place a student in the curriculum at the institution, right? And I know you know this as teachers, that the word failure isn't really a great word. Uh, for whether or not they do terribly well on a test like this, like a placement exam. Uh, instead, we have to think about this test as making sure that we meet students where they are and that they don't uh, move into an educational environment that is non-conducive to their best learning. Um, and oftentimes, a test like this can be used for uh, course credit as well, like a CLEP test. Um, there are some institutions, we don't really have something like this, but uh, institutions where on their placement test, they'll have a little page that's do this page if you want to get out of music theory one, do this next page if you want to get out of music theory two. Um, and also for us on sort of a meta scale, the theory placement exam gives us an idea, um, a good metric of how students are being prepared for college, especially college music theory study. Um, all right. There we go. So the first thing you need to know when you're preparing for a theory placement exam is to know your audience. Know the people to whom you are applying to be a member of their, their student body. Um, the material on the exam is going to vary pretty uh, widely between institutions. Um, so like a place like Eastman or Juilliard, a conservatory will have a really different standard for entering music majors than a place like NSU and Natchitoches. Um, it's just the name of the game, the nature of the beast. Um, but the good news is that most institutions um, widely and, uh, and easily, uh, it's easy to find uh, the information that they need for you to know on their placement test. Um, for instance, uh, there's a, a letter here. I don't expect you to be able to read it because the font's tiny, but I just wanted to give you some like, look, we do have a thing here. Um, this is a letter that we send out to all of our incoming music majors at NSU. Um, and it's in their packet of, you know, application materials. And this is just saying all of the stuff they need to know in order to pass their music theory entrance exam. Um, 
And but uh, this is also on our website, on the music department website. But um, if you don't find anything like that for or if your student doesn't find anything like that for the institution where they're applying, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask because um, I'm sure most theory professors, even though we don't really necessarily project this feeling to most students, most of us don't really have like three heads and, and want to, you know, set everybody on fire. Uh, we want people to succeed just like any other teacher. Uh, and so most of the time your, um, your theory professors will um, gladly share that information with you, the information that's all, that will be required on the entrance exam. <clears throat> Okay, so there are a couple of resources that I would send students to um, <clears throat> sort of right away for um, preparation of these materials. Obviously, a music theory textbook would be pretty good. If um, I know a lot of band directors still have their, their tonal harmony books sitting on a shelf collecting dust in their office, um, you could pull that out. The first two or three chapters of any theory textbook will, be, will comprise all of the material that will be on an exam like this. So, um, and I'm sure if, if it's any theory textbook that I've ever seen, there will be some practice exercises in there for students to use. So um, if you still have your theory textbook sitting around, I have mine, but it's propping up my laptop right now to make it a little higher. So I would show you mine. Um, but um, then that is, is a great place to start. Um, also, what we're going to work with today as a visual aid and as a as sort of a study aid is the website musictheory.net which I find of all of these that I've listed here to be the most helpful and especially the most accessible to uh, most people. Uh, they also have two apps. The, uh, the, they're only available on iOS. So if you're an Android user, I'm very sorry. Uh, but the good news is you don't really need the apps. Uh, I would only suggest the apps for um, students because it's just that much more accessible than a web browser. And if you have school iPads, uh, you can buy it once and install it on all those devices and the students can use that at their, at their leisure. Um, the Teoria.net is another website. I find this website to be especially useful for oral skills because there's a swath of different um, dictation exercises that you can use from this website. And you can give it all sorts of parameters. You can have it play melodies for you, just rhythms, and really uh, work out how to do basic dictation um, with some real success, I think. Uh, and tonesavvy.com, which is the one I'm like the most uh, unfamiliar with, uh, is kind of a subscription only service that is marketed to uh, sort of institutions. Um, it's a good service, but it's not one that I'm going to talk about much uh, today. Okay, so the most common materials that you will find on a placement, a theory placement test are uh, pitch, rhythm, key signatures, meter signatures, scales, and sometimes basic aural skills, okay? And I have a little break here because, you know, a physical distance on a slide means that I think different things about that last line. Um, that last line, advanced theory depends on institution. Like, um, if you go to any state school or any, um, any place like around here, you're not going to be asked to do um, interval qualities, triads and seventh chords, part writing, uh, and in oral skills, you're not going to have to really do um, melodic and, and rhythmic dictation necessarily. Um, but you know, it might happen like again at a, at a, a conservatory or something like that, um, or a high flute in state school. All right. Part one, pitch. Let me get a drink first. Oh, I shouldn't let them see my LSU bottle. <clears throat> Students on a placement test will have to re read or notate pitch. They'll have to read or notate anything that I'm talking about today. Um, so the first thing you need to know that students will have to be able to read, competently read both treble and bass clefs. Um, Oftentimes, one of our students will be placed into the remedial theory class strictly because they're a flute player who never bothered to learn the bass clef. Um, and that's something that can be easily fixed. Um, they're going to have to know note names by letter. 
Uh, we're not going to speak in solfege most of the time. Uh, know that an exam may include uh, accidentals on these notes. So if you're asked to identify a pitch, it might not just be a C, it might be a C sharp, uh, something fancy and super exciting like that. Um, and maybe even register numbers if you're dealing with a professor who studied in, the, in like the 60s and they uh, still care about that stuff, um, which is, uh, you know, where middle C is C4 and everything above that is register four until you get to C5 and then register five. Um, we don't do that on our test and I haven't seen it recently, but just surprises happen sometimes. Um, Students may ask, be asked to read clefs that are specific to their instrument. Like I said, trouble in bass clefs. But if you're going to um, uh, a pretty selective institution where um, they expect their trombonist, for instance, to be reading excerpts right away, uh, they may be asked to do some reading in tenor clef or alto clef. Uh, the same thing goes for, um, you know, a cellist might be asked to read trouble, I mean, obviously trouble clef, but maybe they'll have to read tenor clef as well. Um, and uh, students may be asked to actually notate, so actually write notes on a staff. Um, okay. So for each of these little examples, I've given you some sample questions. So this is a really common type, like way the question would look on a placement test for pitch. Number one here says, give the letter names for each of the notes, pay attention to the clef, and Adam didn't pay attention to his punctuation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say I'm not an English major or whatever, but I think we all should know how to use punctuation. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, so here a student would obviously just notate the, um, the letter name in the blank. Notice here that I've used uh, a combination of pitches with and without accidentals and pitches in the staff and in ledger lines and spaces. They should be prepared to read ledger lines, to read ledger spaces, and obviously to read both treble and bass clefs. Um, remember to inform your student uh, that the, the accidental goes before the note head, but after the note letter. Um, so below the staff, please don't write sharp G, <laughs> write G sharp, um, like one of us uh, civilized people. Um, and you might see a question like number two here, which is uh, just we, you're given a letter name and a clef and a staff and asked to notate the letter uh, using, in this case, I'm asking for half notes. So um, this is a built-in uh, stem direction test as well. And you see if they put uh, the D like in the middle of the staff, they'll have to you know, do the, the sweating meme with the buttons to figure out which direction the, uh, the stem goes. Um, okay, so before we go on to rhythm, I wanna show you a little bit about musictheory.net. Okay, so when you first get to musictheory.net, uh, okay, so I'm gonna say musictheory.net a lot of times today. Um, please don't think that I'm like sponsored by musictheory.net. Uh, I'm just on my regular old TRSL salary like everyone else. Um, this is just my favorite website for prep like this. Um, so yeah, there's my disclosure for the day. Um, musictheory.net will first tell you buy our apps because that's how they make their money. It's, they say it very clearly. We fund this entire website on the sale of the app. One of them's four bucks, one of them's five bucks. It's, um, I think, it might be three and four. Um, they're not super crazy expensive, but uh, one thing I'll say is that you don't need them at all because everything on the apps is available entirely for free on the website, plus some stuff that's not on the apps. So you don't really have to have the apps to do any of what I'm saying today. Um, you just need to have access to a web browser that can run this very basic embedded stuff. Um, okay, so stuff that would be on the Theory Lessons app is under the Lessons tab. This is really good for reviewing basic concepts because each of these little, um, these little tabs here is a full-on program lesson through a theory concept. So like here, uh, let's go to Rest Duration. When you click that, you, you are greeted with this sort of... Uh, cute step-by-step -step thing where if you click through every line you read, a new bit of uh, pertinent information shows up on the screen and you can click through to different parts of it. You don't want to listen to all of it or read all of it. And anytime uh, there is something that has sound, there will be a little, uh, this icon will darken and you can listen, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, that's, that's basically, I, I call theory lessons basically like a free online music theory textbook. 
because it goes all the way down through um, some kind of advanced stuff. It ends with like Neapolitans and, you know, chromatic chords, which is interesting. Um, but what we're going to use today is the exercises portion, which if you're on the front page, that kind of correlates to the Tenuto app. Um, so here, if you want your students to be able to practice note identification, uh, you can come to the exercises tab and click note identification. Um, and you're greeted with this awesome little interface that gives you notes and a bunch of things to click here. Uh, if you click the wrong thing, it'll tell you, no, that's wrong. Uh, and it'll leave it uh, highlighted to, um, I guess, keep, keep you informed that you got something wrong. And it keeps a running score up here, too. But you can always uh, reset that if you don't want to be reminded of your failures. So the nice thing about this is that you can uh, customize this exercise to your liking. You can tell it which clefs to give you or which clefs not to give you. If you suck at the bass clef, um, thank you for moving my window there. Um, if you suck at reading the bass clef, then unselect treble clef and just do bass clef identification. If you're really bad at alto clef and you're having to learn the viola for this concert sight reading season, um, then identify notes in just the alto clef. Um, and you can um, do some other stuff like have it give you key signatures. Um, it's, it's actually really, really nice. And so a student can go through here and just kind of quickly flashcard through all of the, uh, all of the, the identification stuff. And if you want a student to be able to practice um, writing notes on the staff, at least as best you can on like this HTML stuff, um, go down here to note construction. And here again, I, I think I've set this to just treble and bass clefs, yeah. Um, and in no key signature here. So um, here it's B natural, let's see, we don't, we don't want that. We want to notate a C sharp. So we click it up there and then pop a sharp on there, right? Submit answer, yay, you are successful. You're going to be great in life. Um, it can be a little trickier if you add key signatures to the list here, meaning you might be given an uh, example where you're gonna have to be conscious of the key signature as you're naming the note or as you're spelling the note. Um, okay, so those are the exercises for uh, note identification. All right, let's end the screen share. Okay, I'm talking out loud. What am I, my dad? Okay. All right, for rhythm, I think we need to move my move my little bubble again. Up there, over there, maybe down here, that's fine. Okay, um, rhythm, students just need to know how to read and notate rhythm, obviously basic rhythms. Uh, and I'm not talking about meter here, I'm talking about whole notes and half notes. Um, they need to know the values of the notes and their names, uh, notes and rests. Um, they also need to be competent in understanding how many counts each of these notes will get in a given meter signature. Right, so they don't need to just know that a quarter note is half the length of a half note. They need to know in four four, a quarter note will get one beat, um, things like that. They need to be aware of that. Uh, let me show you what our question kind of looks like on our test for rhythm. Um, this is what ours looks like. The instructions read, write the name of each note or rest, i.e. whole note, etc., cetera, um, and then indicate how many beats each will receive in a measure of 4-4 four, four time. So students are asked not only to name that the first one is a half note, but also that in, in a measure of 4-4 four, four time, it would have uh, two beats, obviously. Yeah, there we go. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, when it comes to rhythm, there's one other type of question I've seen on a test before, and that is sort of like a chart of note durations where there will be one column of uh, note values uh, or just the symbols for the pitches for the, uh, sorry, for the rhythms and a column of their names and maybe a column of how many beats they get. And it will be incomplete to different degrees. Like the quarter note will have the note, but not the name of it, but, or the name number of beats it gets. And a student will have to sort of complete that chart. Um, you see charts like that in theory textbooks all over the place. And that's something I think that, um, you educators could probably throw together pretty quickly. But there's nothing really great 
uh, about uh, musictheory.net that teaches you rhythm, rhythm, uh, rhythmic uh, values or any of that stuff, uh, except in the theory lessons, the part of it where it's like a theory textbook. Okay, let's see. No one be alarmed. You don't have to take a theory test today. Um, Students will also have to know key signatures on their placement test, uh, identifying or spelling. Uh, most institutions will not ask for minor key signatures, but be aware that that might be a thing. Obviously ask before you uh, pretend it's not gonna be a thing. Um, you're at least gonna have to know major scale key signatures. Um, you will have to either identify or spell or maybe both. So the, the big challenge with identifying key signatures is just making sure you remember how many sharps or how many flats a particular key has. So if you can just memorize that four equals E major in sharps at least, uh, then you'll be fine. Spelling is a little bit more complicated because you have to remember uh, not only how many sharps, but the order in which they go and their placement on the staff. Um, which is all about, you know, good old fashioned rote memorization at this point. Um, and okay, so this is a big one. Uh, beware of transposing instrument players. When they take their theory placement exam, uh, they may fall victim to something that I almost fell uh, victim to when I was a student. Uh, I, I was raised as a trumpet player, sorry. Um, and for me, when I heard B flat major, I thought, no sharps or flats. Uh, that was just sort of my conditioning because I knew that even if even if my band director was so um, careful to say B flat concert, that th those wires still could get crossed in a student's mind. So uh, tell, make sure that students are aware that they're not going to be asking that on a on a placement test. We're not going to be asking for transposing keys. I don't want necessarily a saxophone player to come in and say two two sharps. Great. D major, or, or sorry, five sharps D major. Um, that really wouldn't be something that we would do, right? Um, okay, so questions might look like this. Provide the following major key signatures. Simple enough. The name of the key is below the staff and a student will be asked to produce the key signature, uh, you know, by hand. Uh, there might also be a question like number two. This is how they show up on our test uh, mainly is um, just name the major key indicated by the key signature. Uh, you may be prepared to do both. Um, in this case, context clues would help you because if you don't remember the order, look at that one with five sharps and at least you've got the order of five sharps, which is kind of cool. Um, you may also see a question like number three here, which is just what is the order of flats? Um, and you know that one is a pretty simple one uh, because we all we all just learned BGCF for flats, right? Um, but uh, there are countless countless um, uh, mnemonics. I almost forgot the word mnemonic, which would have been super duper ironic. Um, uh, there are a lot of mnemonics for remembering the order of sharps. Uh, my favorite one I learned from a middle school kid who was I think eleven at the time, which was four cows got drunk at Ed's bar. It was kind of a fun one. Uh, he learned that from his band director, but that was in Texas and you know, where things are a little different. I hear they're bigger. Let's see. Okay, so uh, when studying on musictheory.net, it's actually pretty simple to deal with key signatures. Um, there is a key signature identification tool. Um, if you click that, I've set it so that it only gives me treble and bass clefs and that it gives me uh, all of the possible key signatures. Again, if your student knows all of the ones with one or two or three sharps in them, they can go in and eliminate those from even being asked. You know, I really need to buckle down on four through seven, right? And then the exercises will reduce the number of possible options here, okay? And again, if uh, the institution requires that students know uh, minor key signatures, you can just go in here in the scale section and uh, click minor there. And then we'll have minor key signatures mixed in with uh, major key signatures in the questions. Uh, and this can just go on forever. It's not like the website's gonna tell them to stop practicing. If it did, that would be really bad. Um, and there's also key signature construction, which is the wonkiest thing I'm gonna show you today. Um, 
here you are given the name of a key and you have to drag this little guy here either up the, the sharp road or the flat road i think you can also just click it but that's not as fun as the drag it feels so much more tactile and then you submit your answer and it tells you you're a good person and then you move on and we do this all day every day and it's you know i'm, I'm actually going to get kind of caught doing this if i don't stop um but this is a great um tool for remembering how to at least construct the major skills. It, it, just make sure your students are aware of like the order that the sharps are going in, you know, the up, down, up, down method, um, just so that they're not, uh, you know, lost in the woods there. All right. All right, this, this is the only part of this whole thing that's gonna be a little bit weird, okay. All right, so meter signatures, oh, look at that, on the trigger, thank you. Um, moving my little bubble around. Um, ooh, I have a chat. <laughs> Good, look, I wasn't even around in 1970, William, so I appreciate the comment. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, meter signatures, students will have to know basically how they function meaning knowing that the lower number is the rhythmic unit measuring the, the bar of music and that the upper number is how many of those is in a measure. Um, I have a bit of an ax to grind because I have to untrain in a lot of my theory students that uh, six eight usually doesn't really have six beats in it. It's easier to teach that to an 11 year old, I know, um, but um, it, it hinders a student's ability to understand things like compound and, and simple meter. Um, if a student, like down here on my list here, a student may be asked to define uh, meters as simple or compound. That is simple meters that are uh, uh, in which the beat is first divided into two parts and then into twos as they go on, uh, like four, four, two, four, uh, two, four, or two, two. Um, and compound meters, meter, meters where the beat unit is divided into three parts, like six, eight, fast, three, four, um, et cetera. Yeah, that's great. Um, Yes, they all, I agree. It's a really great website. Um, okay, so um, uh, though the sort of definitions of meter signatures is not really going to be a huge focus, at least not on our placement test or any I've seen. Um, but down here on my last bullet, uh, one thing that you may not be expecting is if there is an aural component, like a listening component for a theory placement, um, a student may be asked to identify a likely meter signature for a listening example. They may play a march and expect the student to tell you oh, this is probably in 6-8, or they may play, you know, like a, a, I don't know, a pop song or something, and they're all in 4-4, four, four, so that's pretty great, or most of them, statistically all. So um, here are sample questions for what meter might be, and this is meter and rhythm kind of. Um, like number one here just says, supply the appropriate time signature for the following excerpt. Uh, here, even though there are three quarter notes value in each of those measures, uh, you can see through the orthodox beaming of three eighth notes at a time that this is probably six eight. Um, students should be made aware that that difference is important. Um, they wouldn't be thrown out of college if they put three, eight, three, four there, but uh, six, eight is obviously a better answer. This is El Capitan in case anybody cares. Um, I'm not really a Monty Python fan, but I'm sure it's great. Uh, number two here is more about counting rhythm in the context of meter. So if you do any rhythmic counting, um, like solfege, rhythmic solfege, like one and two and, or one te, two te, um, then uh, students may be asked to use that on their entrance exam. So here, obviously, they would go and write the counts in under the staff <clears throat> if you're, um, if you're uh, required to do that, then that's how you would be asked. Um, <clears throat> now, a good way to practice this, especially number one, is um, as educators, you probably have a few scores sitting around. Um, you can um, quickly sort of quiz your students guess the meter, cover up the, the time signature, guess what the meter is, um, and you can have them practice that with each other. They, they, from at least six feet apart, can hold up a piece of paper covering up the meter signature, covering up that side of the page, and have um, you know a little sort of battle on who can guess the most meters correctly. Um, and for rhythmic counting, obviously, 
<clears throat> if, if you're doing this in your classroom, you know how to apply that to your teaching. <clears throat> okay. Scales, everyone's favorite thing. Um, most institutions on a placement test will only require major scales, uh, knowledge of major scales. Uh, they may require minor scales, but we don't here. Um, and if they do, it will only be uh, natural minor scales, most likely. But, you know, crazier things that have happened besides uh, people asking for a, a melodic minor scale here or there. Um, students may be asked to do one of three things on their test. They may be asked to spell a scale in note names only, like literally just write them in a blank, not on a staff, not notating them. Uh, they may be asked to notate the scale using accidentals, um, or they may be asked to identify a major scale from a number of uh options, meaning they may be shown three scales, only two of which are actually major scales, and they have to eliminate the one that's not, something like that. Um, again, here, be beware of your transposing kiddos, because they may see uh, instructions that say, play the, or write the A flat major scale, and your little horn player's like, great, three flats. Um, not that that's how horn players sound, but, you know. Uh, my my mailing address at my uh, institution, hudlowa at nsula.edu for your complaints about my mistreatment of horn players today. Sorry, Thayel. Okay. So we are moving a bit further here. Okay, here's scale sample question. Really simple. Um, a blank staff, write the A flat major scale using, uh, do not use a key signature. That means they don't, we don't want a student to provide a key signature and then write a bunch of donuts. We want students to not only be able to understand what flats are in the scale, but to, uh, this is a touch point for us to um, see that a student knows where to place accidentals in relation to the note heads that they modify. So this is sort of a meta exercise. That's why we don't ask for key signatures here or ask them to avoid key signatures. Um, on musictheory.net, um, studying scales is actually pretty cool. There is scale identification in the identification section. Here I have set it only to give me, um, oh, all the major scales. No, I don't want that. I just want major scales only. Here we go. It's major. That's not really that helpful. That's why I had it set to four. Ah, okay. Now you have to tell the uh, the application if this is a major, natural minor, harmonic minor, or melodic minor scale. You guys having flashbacks of music theory class? Okay, that's good. It's part of the reason we exist as theory professors is to see that squirm that happens a bit. Um, I didn't say that. This is recorded. Dang it. Um, okay, so uh, scale construction maybe a bit more productive for students who uh, don't know how to use, to write scales. Um, here I have it set uh, just to ask me to write major scales. Um, you can have it only ask you to write certain scales. Right now I have it limited only to ask me to write scales with up to three sharps or flats. Obviously you can ask, you can have it ask you to spell anything. Um, but here the way that you do this is you go through each of the notes and you supply the accidentals that you need all the way through and you click it'll submit. I don't know if you can hear, but it's, it's playing back, um, which is kind of a cute touch. But this is an absolutely perfect way to study writing scales and they don't know how to do, they don't need to know how to do any, like anything else after this. Um, but it would be nice for you to um, uh, suggest to your students to actually, oh, cool, sweet. Thanks, Elisa. I love you. Um, uh, it would be nice to ask your students, for you to ask your students to uh, to do some notation by hand because that's what they'll have to do on their placement test. So um, it would be nice for them to practice a little bit of notation because they're going to have to do it. Um, okay, so aural skills. Ooh, I'm going to move me. Nope. Oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, oral skills will be um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we do not have any oral skills on our placement test here at NSU, um, but I know uh, at least one other institution in this state that does have oral skills on their placement test. But the oral skills is very, very basic, meaning um, 
a, a professor would play uh, two notes and ask if the notes are ascending or descending, uh, or they may play a scale and ask if the scale is major or minor, or they may play um, a simple rhythmic dictation or um, uh, meter dictation. I didn't mean, oh yeah, meter dictation. That, that, that's what I was talking about earlier with uh, playing a piece of music and asking what the meter might be. Um, you may have to do melodic dictation, but I wouldn't count on having to do melodic dictation as an entering freshman. Um, you may have to do basic vocalization as an oral skills student or as part of your placement test. But uh, again, I really wouldn't count on that, especially um, at most places around here again. But you can practice that on musictheory.net. There are um, exercises for, um, let me just show you. I don't have to like not show you, I need to show you. There are exercises um, for um, identifying intervals. You can just do something very basic, like identifying if it's going up or down. You can do um, dictation of scales. So um, it's it's actually pretty nice. It's not, again, it's not really where I would spend my energy. I would spend my energy on the other stuff that we've talked about. Oral skills just doesn't happen on placement tests that, that often. Um, I'm getting really fast at getting back into the slideshow. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. Um, Okay, so um, now more advanced music theory, like spelling triads, spelling seventh chords, spelling or doing part writing or any Roman numeral analysis, counterpoint stuff. You may cover that, like if you teach uh, um, like a talent music class or like an AP music theory class, um, that won't really be on one of these placement tests. These placement tests are designed to determine if a student is ready to start music theory one. And music theory one does start with here is a staff. You've seen it before, but let's learn a little more about it. You know, it's not base level stuff, but it's not, you know, it's not um, super duper advanced either. So if you're teaching something to your students or they're learning this, or if they're pianists or something, um, then at that point they need to take their AP tests because a lot of universities, including this one, will offer um, college credit um, for AP music theory scores. So like here at NSU, if you get a four on your uh, AP music theory test, you get out of music theory one and oral skills one and you, and you go straight into theory two. Uh, if you get a five, you get out of your whole freshman year of music theory, you can go straight to music theory three. Um, and so know that if, if a student is learning things to that extent, they're going to be fine on a test like this anyway. Um, if they are writing, if they're spelling triads, they, they know how to spell notes, right? Um, I don't think that that should be a huge, huge issue. Okay. So, um, this last few minutes I've, uh, left open in case anybody has any questions for me. Um, I'll be watching the chat over the next couple of minutes. Um, what I want you guys to take away from today is obviously a little bit of competency with musictheory.net if you haven't used it before. It's a really great website. It's super free. Uh, it doesn't cost any dollars, and that's, that's great. Um, but also, it can be used in a way that can prepare your students for their placement test, and God forbid, maybe make them better uh, members of your band, choir, or orchestra anyway. Um, you know, because it would be nice for all of your students to know all of this stuff anyway, even if they're not going to major in music. Um, if you have any questions for me, I'm sure I can make these slides available for you so you can see, um, so you can see those sample questions that I provided throughout, um, this talk. But, uh, if you, uh, if I can, I guess I can make this, uh, slideshow available or maybe somebody else can see it. Um. Ah, okay. That's a good one. I have a question here. Okay, so the question is from the support team. Uh, I'm assuming that's uh, our lovely host. Um, do you know of any similar apps or websites for instrument finger recognition? Not necessarily. The music theory.net does have, um, a really cool tool on the Tenuto app that is like a, a fretboard where you can use a fretboard to identify notes. Um, or, um, 
you can identify notes on a keyboard as well. Let me show you on, on what I'm talking about with musictheory.net at least. Um, here there is a keyboard note identification. If you click that, you are given a note and you have to identify the pitch on the keyboard, which is kind of cool. Um, you can, uh, oh, here's the fretboard note identification. This is where I, I'm completely lost because I'm not a uh, player of something with frets. Um, but here, let me see, what is four halves to the above E? It's a G sharp, is that right? Nice, nailed it. Um, okay, so this this would be good, obviously, if you're teaching like a guitar, a guitar class or something like that. Um, I think you can change the fretboard too. Yeah, there we go. Change it to a bass. That's nice. Oh, there's no violin though. I guess that doesn't really have frets anyway. Ooh, my wife coming in with a better answer than mine. Nice. <laughs> um, are there any other questions here? This is very much like when I teach music theory via WebEx. You know, are there any questions? No, no, we've been making coffee this whole time. Um, all right, um, I'm not seeing any other chats. So I guess I'll take this opportunity to thank everyone who uh, is here and who um, took the time to come listen to me, which is a little scary that people are listening to me as an expert in something. Um, anybody who's uh, listening or in the future, hello, what's the weather like today? Man, did we have flying cars yet? That's awesome. Okay. I appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for LMEA hosting me today. Um, hope somebody got some stuff out of this and uh, have a great conference.